Hi guys. So today we are talking about chapter 10, but I have divided it up into two parts. So we're going to talk about the nervous system itself first, and then we're going to talk about action potentials. So we're going to talk about how the nervous system works. So first off, the job of the nervous system. The point is for it to respond to stimuli. Without the ability to respond to stimuli and changes in our environment, we're going to die. So the nervous system is what gathers that information and then decides on what to do about it, interpret the information, and then issue a response. The whole goal is to maintain homeostasis, which remember is that happy, steady state our body needs to be in. So nervous tissue is divided into two types. There are neurons, which are the actual cells of the nervous system, and then neuroglia, which are supporting cells for the neurons. So the neurons are the ones that actually react to the changes and send the nerve impulses for communication and a response. The neuroglia are what surround and support the neurons. So they're going to nourish the neurons, they're going to maintain that blood-brain barrier, and they're going to, very importantly, make sure that the neurons have everything that they need. So as you can see in the picture, the neuron is the main cell in the middle, and then the neuroglia are the supporting cells around it. The nervous system itself is divided into two main divisions, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord, and as you can see, it is in red, so remember that. The peripheral nervous system is what connects the central nervous system to the rest of the body. So it includes the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves, and we'll talk about those later on. So here's a picture just showing you the central nervous system is just the brain and the spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system and the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. Now the peripheral nervous system is subdivided into the sensory division and the motor division. The motor division is subdivided into the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is just the skeletal muscle and the autonomic nervous system are the smooth cardiac muscle and glands. So the autonomic think automatic, so it responds automatically. So smooth muscle, the main place that we find it is our digestive tract and our visceral organs. So we don't have to tell those to do anything. It does it automatically. Cardiac, of course, is our heart and glands like endocrine glands and eccrine glands and everything else. So the autonomic nervous system is further subdivided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic is the fight or flight response. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. But the sympathetic can always override the parasympathetic. So that's the one that's really in charge. And we'll talk about both of those systems later on. Migraines are a thing that a lot of people suffer from, including my youngest daughter. Signs that you are having a migraine, you'll have a pounding headache, you'll feel nauseous something called an aura where you have shimmering images in your visual field and you usually will have light sensitivity and possibly sound sensitivity. Environmentally speaking, there are some triggers. Bright light, of course, is going to be a trigger, but actually some food, stress, caffeine, alcohol, lack of sleep, and even weather have an impact on if you're going to have a migraine or not. There's hormonal triggers in women as well. A lot of women will have a migraine right before they start their menstruation cycle. Now, depending on their severity, they can last anywhere from four hours to 72 hours. Basically, what's happening is you're going to have certain neurons at the bottom of your brain are going to be excited. Then they're going to stimulate these pain sensations followed by unresponsiveness. So we can't really do anything about it. A big thing that you want to try to do is to identify triggers and then, of course, avoid those triggers. Treatments, there are a lot of drugs out there. My daughter takes Imitrex if she is having a migraine, and she takes Topamax to try to prevent them. There are drugs called triptans that can halt the migraine attack. 
And basically what they do is they constrict the blood vessels. So it could be a problem to some people. Transcranial magnetic stimulation can also work for if you just have them once in a while or all the time for the rest of your life. Treatments to lower the frequency. A new one out there is actually Botox injections. They have started using Botox injections to basically paralyze the nerves so you don't feel that pain. One of my nurses actually gets these Botox injections for her migraines because I have a morphine pump, so I have to go and get it refilled, and she's the one that refills them. So we talk a lot, obviously. So she said that it's like 32 needles, little tiny needles, that you have to get injected all around your head. But then it usually lasts about three months. So she said it's worth it. I don't know if I can take that. But a drug that binds to the neurotransmitter that causes that dilation and inflammation of the blood vessels could also work. Other drugs have actually been repurposed that were used for other things like antidepressants and anticonvulsants. Also, calcium and channel blockers and beta blockers that treat high blood pressure have been repurposed to treat migraines. Functionally speaking, there are three main functions of the nervous system, sensory, integration, and motor. Sensory function, as the name implies, it's the sensory receptors gathering information because they can detect any changes in the environment, and then they carry that information to the central nervous system. The central nervous system is what integrates all of the information and creates sensations and thoughts makes the decision and then sends out a response. The response is taken out through the motor division, the motor function. So the impulses are gonna be carried to the effectors, which are usually muscles or glands. Again, the division of the motor peripheral nervous system, the somatic and the autonomic. The somatic is the voluntary skeletal muscle movements. Autonomic is automatic, so it's involuntary. So again, we don't have to tell our heart to beat. We don't have to tell our stomach to start digesting, that kind of thing. Neurons can also vary in size and shape. The length of their axons and dendrites can vary. And neurons actually are constantly making new connections as we learn things. So as you're learning this information, your neurons are making new connections. But they all have three features. The cell body, which is also called the soma. That's where you're gonna find the organelles, the nucleus, missile body, cytoplasm. The dendrites are the branches that actually receive the information. A neuron can have a lot of dendrites, but a neuron only has one axon. And that's what transmits the impulses and then releases the neurotransmitter to impact another neuron or an effector. So here's a picture, you can see the cell body in blue at the top, the nucleus and some of the organelles are there. The dendrites are all of those extensions coming out. So the dendrites are gonna get the incoming signals. At the bottom of the cell body, I want you to pay attention to the axon hillock. That's gonna be important in part two because that is where the nerve impulse or action potential as it's called is actually triggered. And then it goes down the axon to the axon terminal to the synaptic knobs. And the synaptic knobs are what release the vesicles that have the neurotransmitters in them. You can see in this picture something called Schwann cells. They produce myelin to produce the myelin sheath. And we're going to talk about Schwann cells in a sec. So they are part of the peripheral nervous system. They encase the axon kind of like a jelly roll. It's a bunch of rolls on top of each other surrounding that axon. The rolls or the myelin basically is composed of a lipoprotein mixture. So it's a lot of lipids. So that makes myelinated axons white. It's called the myelin sheath and each Schwann cell has a spot between two cells basically. It's a gap called the node of Ranvier. 
And what happens is when an impulse is being transmitted down the axon, it can actually jump from node to node to node. So that makes transmission a lot faster. Not all axons are myelinated though. Myelinated axons in the peripheral nervous system are gonna have a bunch of Schwann cells lined up along the axon. Each one is gonna wrap the axon in that insulating myelin sheath. And there's going to be nodes of RANVA between them. So the impulse can jump from node to node to node. And we'll talk more about that in part two of the lecture. Unmyelinated axons are also encased by the Schwann cell cytoplasm, but they don't have that myelin sheath or that coating to surround the axons. Multiple sclerosis, or MS, occurs when the central nervous system myelin sheaths are actually destroyed by our own immune system. The myelin is basically attacked by antibodies that our immune system produces. Our immune system does not recognize it as self, so it attacks it as if it's a foreign body. Scars or sclerosis are left behind, and that's going to stop the neurons from conducting impulses because once the impulse gets to that scar tissue, it can't go any further. So without input from the motor neurons, the muscles are basically gonna stop working and they're gonna atrophy. Other symptoms, you could have mood problems, blurred vision. Of course, your limbs are going to become weak and numb because the muscles are dying. And fatigue, because again, the muscles are dying. Treatments involve drugs that suppress the immune system so that those antibodies are not created. MS also occurs in flare-ups, so it's one of those disorders that is not exactly easy to treat. Neurons can be classified two ways, structurally or functionally. Structurally speaking, they can be multipolar, bipolar, or unipolar. Multipolar, most of the neurons, about 99% are multipolar, and most neurons of the central nervous system are multipolar. They have a lot of processes coming off of the cell body. Bipolar only have two processes, bi means two, so that kind of tells you that. The eyes, the ears, and the nose are bipolar. Unipolar only has one process, una means one. The cell bodies and the ganglia and the sensory are going to be unipolar. So if you look at the picture, look at that cell body. When we talk about processes, we're just talking about extensions from the cell body. So it could be the dendrites, could be the axon. They're both processes. So the multipolar has a bunch of dendrites and the axon coming off of it, which is why it's multipolar. Bipolar has two processes, one going to the dendrites, and then the axon. Unipolar, you can see that the one going to the dendrites and the axon are merged together before they attach to the cell body. So that's why it's unipolar. They can be classified by function as well. We have sensory, interneurons, or motor. Sensory neurons are going to pick up the sensation. They're going to detect that change. The receptors are what are actually going to detect the change. The sensory receptors are going to send that information through the sensory neuron to the central nervous system. So those are the afferent neurons. Most of them are unipolar, but some are bipolar. The inner neurons are in the central nervous system, and this is the link between the sensory neurons and the motor neurons. Inter means between, so it's between the neurons. These are multipolar and they're association neurons because that's what's going to transfer the information from the sensory neuron to the motor neuron. So the information is going to be integrated, a decision is going to be made, and an order will be sent out through the motor neuron. Motor neurons are multipolar. They are efferent, E for exit. So they carry impulses away from the central nervous system. They're going to carry the impulses to the effector, whatever that effector is. Generally speaking, the neuroglia provide structural support for neurons. In the embryo, they actually guide the neurons into position so that they can specialize. They also produce growth factors to nourish the neurons. 
so that they can basically control the environment. They're going to take away any excess ions or neurotransmitters that are there. They also aid in the formation of synapses. So we have six types of neuroglia. Four of them are in the central nervous system. Two of them are in the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system, the astrocytes, these are the ones that are basically in control of the environment. So they're going to connect the neurons to the blood vessels and help the exchange of nutrients and growth factors. They also form scar tissue. They basically regulate the ion concentrations, help metabolism, and also are part of the blood-brain barrier. Oligodendrocytes are the myelinating axons in the central nervous system, and they also provide structural support. Microglia are the immune system cells, so those are the phagocytic cells and also provide structural support. Now the ependyma or ependymal cells line the central canal of the spinal cord and the ventricles of the brain. They cover the choroid plexuses. Now remember the choroid, or not remember, but we'll cover the fact that the choroid plexuses secrete cerebral spinal fluid. Cerebral spinal fluid protects the brain and the spinal cord. So the ependymal cells are going to help regulate the composition of the cerebral spinal fluid to make sure it has everything that we need. They are made up of cuboidal or columnar cells that are ciliated. So here's a picture showing you. Now the one thing I want you to notice is that oligodendrocyte in yellow. Notice that one oligodendrocyte is wrapping around multiple axons. So they're not like the Schwann cells. The Schwann cells are individual cells, kind of like jelly rolls that surround the axon. These oligodendrocytes send out and cover multiple axons. That's going to become important when we talk about regeneration in a minute. The two of the peripheral nervous system are the Schwann cells that we've talked about already. Remember, they speed up transmission of the nerve impulse because they form that myelin sheath. Remember, the myelin sheath is made up of lipids, so it appears white. And then satellite cells. We're not really sure what they do, but we know that they support the neuron cell bodies. Mature neurons are amitotic, meaning they do not divide. So if a cell body is injured, the neuron usually dies. But there's a big difference between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, if the axon is injured, it may actually regenerate because the Schwann cells can help form the axon and guide it where it needs to go. So if the axon is separated from the cell body and it's myelin sheath, that part is going to degenerate. The Schwann cells and the neurolemma are still there, so they're going to actually provide a guiding way for the growing axon to regenerate. Then that growing axon can establish the former connection, function will return. If for some reason it doesn't quite make that connection though, function is going to be lost. Neuron regeneration in the central nervous system, however, is different because the central nervous system axons do not have that neurolemma to act as a guide. Oligodendrocytes do not proliferate after injury, so they're not going to regenerate. So that's why if, let's say, you get your pinky cut off, they can reattach it and actually get function back in it because those axons can grow and make those former connections because of the Schwann cells. But if you get an injury down your spinal cord, most likely you're going to be paralyzed from the point of injury down because oligodendrocytes do not grow after the injury. This is just showing you how the Schwann cells are going to guide the regeneration. So where you get your injury, that part is going to degenerate. And then the Schwann cells will guide the new axon to get to the former connection. Neurons communicate with each other through synapses. Now a synapse is a site where a neuron transmits a nerve impulse to another neuron. So it's basically the space between neurons. It's a functional connection between the neuron and the skeletal muscle fiber. So this is how muscles contract as well. The neuron is going to 
meet with the muscle fiber, basically. But there's going to be that little space between them, and that's called the synaptic cleft. There are two types of neurons, presynaptic and postsynaptic. Pre means before, post means after. So presynaptic would be before the synapse, postsynaptic would be after the synapse. So the presynaptic neuron is going to send the impulse and it's going to release the neurotransmitter through exocytosis. The postsynaptic neuron is what receives the impulse and then the synaptic cleft separates the two. We're going to talk what happens next in part two of this chapter. So I will talk to you then. Bye.